Okay, great. So um, thank you for joining us today. I am Janet Zhang. I'm the Deputy Executive Director at BridgeM Shanghai. So for us in Shanghai, these days are quite challenging as we all have to deal with the lockdown, a range of business, a range of staff working from home, but actually remote working and online workshops are no stranger to us since um, 2020. However, while enjoying the flexibility and reduce the cost, some companies also said that they are struggling with low engagement and other challenges. So is that virtual learning just simply moving offline training to online ones? Or how can I overcome the most common challenges with online training and the transition from just workshops to full learning journeys? So to advise on this in the next one hour, our two guest speakers will share tips and experience of overcoming the challenges and how to grow from just virtual workshops to whole learning journeys. And during the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function in Zoom. We will have a QA session around um, 4.45 to advise on your questions. So um, for the first 15 minutes, let's welcome Jamie Dixon, a leadership coach, trainer, and author. Jamie has helped ambitious leaders in over 160 multinational companies over the last 10 years, improving their influence, communication, and productivity. So Jamie, hand it over to you now. Okay, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you very much everyone for joining us today as well. Um, and uh, I was guessing that virtual learning might become a bit more popular in China this year. Uh, and I, I think with what's been happening recently, I might be right. It seems this event has come at, at just the right time. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about how to improve engagement uh, with virtual learning. And afterwards, uh, my friend Mark Williams, who's joining us from the UK, he's going to talk about how to really realize the full potential that virtual learning has to offer us and help us get the most from it. And to start with, a quick question for everyone, and you can share your thoughts in the chat. Uh, what challenges do you face with virtual training? What kind of challenges do you face with virtual training? So if everyone could share your thoughts in the chat, please. Yeah, Pat, engagement uh, definitely seems to be the, the main problem. Derek getting people to turn their cameras on, a very specific problem with engagement online. Uh, true, we can't use Zoom, so everyone is forced to use Teams. Everyone hates using Teams. Even Microsoft hate using Teams, I've heard as well. Uh, Lin Yan cannot focus well. Um, Sam, yeah, challenges with focus. Uh, it seems a lot of people join these virtual workshops from the office and they're constantly distracted or well, they're working at home with kids and dogs in the background. Uh, Jessica, uh, good to see you again, Jessica, by the way. We have to educate people. They're not passengers. They need to interact. And sometimes they're not so willing to interact. And these are all challenges that I have seen quite a lot with virtual training over the last two years. Um, one very interesting uh, phenomenon about virtual training is it seems to be a lot easier to get people to commit to spending one whole day in a room than it is to get them to commit to spending one hour online. Uh, it's so hard to get people to commit to that, uh, to not change their schedules in the last minute. And then when they do sign on, to be focused and to be attending and interacting in the right way. Um, and so today I'm gonna share some tips around the interaction part. Uh, and I'm really excited for what Mark Williams will be sharing afterwards, because Mark, he's based in the UK. And over the last two years, um, the UK has been doing a lot of online training. Pretty much all training has been online. And Mark has been helping facilitators and companies from around the world turn their training from just a one-off workshop 
into a full on learning journey. And he will be sharing a bit more about that in just a while. But to start with the actual workshop itself and how to improve engagement in these workshops, just some tips and a good place to start is to set expectations for everybody. Make sure that before we arrange these workshops, before we send out the invites, we communicate our expectations of participants beforehand. So uh, if there are things that they have to do, like for example, Derek mentioned earlier that we want to turn on, uh, we want them to turn on their cameras and they don't always turn on their cameras, then we can provide suggestions for how they can do that. And turning on people's cameras, for example, is actually quite challenging for some people. Some people are joining the virtual workshop from their bathrooms or they're joining in the early morning and they haven't done their makeup or something. And it feels very awkward for them to turn their cameras on. So it can be, there can be a lot of barriers for them. So it can be very helpful to provide some suggestions on how to do this. Some workshops are using apps outside of Zoom or Teams. For example, they might be using Mural or Miro, two apps that are very, very popular for virtual workshops right now. And it can take a while for people to learn how to use these and to register accounts for them as well. So giving people some suggestions on how to use these, some instructions on how to use these as well. One thing that, in my opinion, uh, from the clients I've worked with, uh, they could improve upon is actually being more strict with the participants. If they don't follow instructions, then kick them out of the virtual workshop. And I have actually done this in some virtual workshops before, and it's quite effective when people realize that if they don't, uh, if they don't participate in the right way, then they're going to get kicked out and it will make them look bad. So ensure that there are going to be consequences for not engaging in the, in the expected way. And one really practical tip is before you even start the, the virtual workshops, it can be really useful to send out an engagement contract. Uh, just a few things that people agree to do get them to sign their names, get them to take a photograph of themselves and send in a WeChat group, or even get them, get them to take a video of themselves and send to the group to show everyone that they are taking this seriously. So expectations about how they will interact must be communicated clearly beforehand. And uh, Jessica, yeah, agree, you need to set boundaries. So yes, these and these are just so much more important in the virtual world than face-to-face. -face. In face-to-face, -face, we interact face-to-face -face every single day, and we're all used to it, and we all have these norms and expectations. But on the virtual world, it's still quite new to a lot of people, and we need to do a bit more work to build and strengthen those norms. Another thing that we want to do before we actually start the workshop itself is to run a test session. And maybe this is a few days before the workshop. We can run a test session to help participants learn how to use the technology. Maybe they don't know how to use Zoom or Teams, or maybe they haven't used it for a long time and recently the software has been updated and they need to learn how these new functions work. Another thing that can be useful is to help them get to know each other. And in my experience in China in particular, if people don't know each other, they don't feel comfortable enough opening up to each other. And so it's very important to spend time at the beginning of the workshop, helping people get to know each other so that they can relax. And once they can relax with other people, engagement will naturally increase from there. And another thing is to make sure everything works. So for a lot of us joining from China, uh, we know that uh, the internet is quite unique in China um, and not every platform works over here. And we are sometimes going to be working with participants from all over the world. 
So we want to make sure that the technology works for everybody. And so the test session can allow us to discover that before it's too late. Um, and another thing is to set and manage expectations again. And I think it's really important to reinforce these expectations repeatedly. At the very beginning, sign an engagement contract to make sure they know their expectations. During the test session, repeat these expectations. At the beginning of the workshop, repeat these expectations again and really hammer home what the norms should be and what our expectations are, and what's expected of them. Now, when it comes to actually running the workshop itself, we also wanna be quite flexible because we don't need for example, to have cameras on all the time. But we do need to make sure that the required way of interacting will work. So virtually, if we're running a workshop, we want to be interacting with people. And there are seven ways of interacting virtually, which you can see here. And at the bottom is the simpler ways of interacting and towards the top, the more complicated ways of interacting. I find chat is something pretty much nobody has a problem with. Uh, everyone feels comfortable with the chat box because you don't have to turn on the camera if you haven't had if you haven't got your makeup on yet. Um, when we go up the level, uh, up the different levels, for example, annotation. Not everybody understands how to use the annotation function. Not everyone can find it. And sometimes I can't even find it. Video, not everyone is co uh, comfortable using video. Breakout rooms, I love for facilitating workshops, but sometimes things go wrong at the breakout rooms. And apps can add really great functionality, but there is greater risk of things going wrong with these. When we are running workshops face to face, we don't have to think about how to interact. We just interact. But on, in the virtual world, we have to think about which channel are we going to be interacting through and plan that in advance and make sure everyone knows how to use that channel to interact effectively. But different, learn, uh, different virtual learning formats will require different ways of interacting. So for example, if you're going to be running a group discussion, that definitely will require breakout rooms, a microphone, and ideally video. So we definitely want to have those if we're running group discussions. If instead it's just a lecture, at most we are going to be interacting through chat, and maybe annotation. Uh, we don't need people to have their cameras on for a lecture. And so we sometimes want to lower our expectations and be a bit more flexible. People don't always need to have their cameras on. If it's a presentation and we're asking people to present back to everyone, then definitely requires a microphone. I would say video, ideally, if not definitely, and also the ability to share screens and make sure that's working in advance. So be realistic about what kind of interaction is required. Um, if they're just watching a lecture, they don't need video on, for example, and we can relax that expectation a bit. So be a bit flexible with how we want people to interact. Again, when we are running the workshop, uh, as I'm sure you all have experience with right now, we want to assign a producer. And a producer can really help boost engagement if we use them in the right way. Obviously, they can handle the technical side of things, allowing the facilitator or presenter to just focus on facilitating or presenting. But they can also provide support to people in need to help us keep focusing on what we need to focus on. And they can also push people who are not engaging appropriately. If, if we've asked people to turn on their cameras and they haven't turned on their cameras, the producer can go around sending private messages to people, nagging them to turn on their cameras. 
And another thing they can do is they can act as spies <laughs> to report back on the people who didn't engage correctly. Uh, and that adds a bit more pressure and really helps to increase the engagement from everybody. Um, ultimately, producers can be used to help hold people accountable for engaging in the right way. And I think that accountability for engaging in the right way is just so much more important in the virtual world. When we are running group activities, another way of boosting engagement is to assign group roles for the, for the, acti uh, for the activities. So give each person a role. For example, one person will be the facilitator to make sure that everyone is talking, the quiet, uh, the loud people are, are controlled and the quiet people are encouraged to speak out. Another person can be the scribe. Maybe their job is to capture notes that everyone has been talking about on a PPT slide. Another person can be the timekeeper to remind everyone we've got three minutes left, one minute left, and so on. And another person can be the spokesperson, the person who will be presenting back to the group. In my experience, when everyone has a clear focus during the activity, they will be a lot more focused <laughs> naturally because they've got something to focus on and they will be a lot more engaged because of that. So make sure everyone's task is very, very clearly described before the activity begins. One other thing is to relax. In my experience, again, I found people show a lot more patience with online training than face-to-face -face training. Uh, they almost expect it to go wrong. Um, and th because they understand things can, can go wrong. They understand how complicated it is. So if you run a, a virtual workshop and it doesn't go well, then don't worry, that's the way it probably is supposed to be. Just learn from your mistakes and keep improving and keep experimenting with new techniques, tactics and technology. And a top tip from me is a principle I call the 70-30 principle, which means whenever I run a workshop, I will always do 70% of things that I've done before and I'll use the extra 30% for things that I've never done before, for a chance to experiment with new ways of explaining things, new content, new activities, maybe even new technology on the virtual workshops. So when you follow that 70-30 rule, your workshop is more likely to be stable because you've got 70% of things you've done before but you're also gonna be learning from your experience because you're experimenting with new things. And it's only really by experimenting with things that you learn and that you improve. So if you make mistakes, that's fine. But if you're using the 70-30 principle, your mistakes will be in the minimum, in the minimal. And that way you will also be able to learn a lot more from your experience as well. And this tip applies in particular to companies and teams, because when it comes to using virtual technology effectively, it is really all about culture. And because a lot of these technologies are still relatively new, a lot of people and a lot of organizations have not developed the right norms or the right culture to use these. And so engagement is not so much about the workshop or the facilitator. It's more about the culture and the norms and what people are used to. So if you're running a team or a company and you want people to engage better online, then some critical people who will really set the standard are internal trainers because they're going to be the ones running the most training. And if they can get people used to doing training online in the right way, you will build the right norms. So internal training delivered in the right way can build good habits for everybody and set good expectations for everybody. So that when an external facilitator like myself or Mark comes in, uh, then 
it works. <laughs> it just works. And you're going to get the most from inviting an external facilitator. But if you don't already have that culture in place, it's going to be a lot more challenging. So a tip here is to start with the smaller, simpler trainings, things like onboarding or compliance trainings, anything that you can, things that might be 60 minutes long, 90 minutes long, move them online and start getting people used to doing things online and invest in your internal trainers. If you can invest in their online facilitation skills, then they will help to raise the standard for everyone, develop those norms, build that culture, and ensure that your company will get the most from virtual learning. And talking about getting the most from virtual learning, running one workshop or one training session is what a lot of companies do. But there is so much more that you can get when you go beyond just one workshop or one, uh, uh, one training session. And what we want to do is transition from a one-off training to a whole learning journey. And that is what Mark is going to talk about in, in just a moment. And I, I see Derek has just, uh, has just shared a comment, exactly the issue I find as the majority of virtual experiences are not run by experienced virtual experts. We have two years of new hires whose only normal is virtual. They have no concept of the normal the rest of us want to go back to. Additionally, no matter how good any trainer is at using virtual, the norm we all face is that the vast majority of virtual experiences expect them to be passive participants. Yes. And that was uh, a problem I noticed at the beginning of the pandemic in China. We had a few months of lockdown. A lot of trainers panicked and went to doing things online with no experience and did a terrible job and put people off. And a lot of the clients I was speaking to a few months later didn't want to do online ever again because they'd had bad, ex bad experiences. But if you can help people get used to having good experiences, you can get the most from virtual learning. And I actually think there's more potential from virtual learning than face-to-face -face learning. Um, and Douglas mentions, you deliver virtual workshops. What would you say is your percentage split between delivery of content instructions versus group activity interactions? Um, let's get uh, let's come back to that question towards the end, because we're going to have a Q&A towards the end. So I'm going to pass over to Mark now. Um, for anyone who would like uh, to keep in touch with me, uh, these are my contact details. Uh, Douglas, I got your question in the chat, so we'll come back to those towards the end. So I'll stop sharing now, and I'll introduce you to Mark, who is going to talk about how to turn your tr one-off trainings into full learning journeys. So over to you, Mark, in the UK. Thank you very much, Jamie. Thanks for that introduction and uh, fabulous tips around um, moving the training onto, into the virtual world, which we've interestingly all had to. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. Oh, it's disappeared. So Jamie's given us a really good introduction to all of his experience and tips around making the most of the virtual space as opposed to um, the in-person training that probably all of us were very used to and was very much our comfort zone um, two years ago, just over two years ago. Um, what I'm going to now look at is just as relevant to what we were doing two years ago, but is even more relevant now with the need to deliver things virtually. And that's that final point that Jamie made, which was all about one workshop on its own does not work in terms of delivering significant behavioral change. So when I'm talking about learning journeys here, we're going to be talking about significant behavioral change, not simple little knowledge transfers that might need a short training session. So the first thing I'm going to ask everyone 
is a little bit like Jamie asked about the challenges of virtual, and maybe we can have uh, some comments in the chat here, is what do you perceive a learning journey to be? And the reason I ask that question is that in this wonderful world of learning that we inhabit, there's lots of different titles and names and labels for everything we do. And I often find that people have very wildly different perceptions about uh, what those titles mean. So do you want to put anything in the chat uh, telling us what they perceive a learning journey to be? Anyone got any suggestions? No one going to put any ideas in there? Or should, maybe we should jump straight through. Never ending. Absolutely fantastic. It's an experience to a new area. Fabulous. I'm going to, I'm going to use it. I love the never ending concept because essentially we are always learning, aren't we? And it never ends. Where I want to take us with this conversation today is this idea and a connected, linked learning experiences. Absolutely. Connections all the way through. Integrated plan and learning. I've probably opened a can of worms here. We're going to get lots and lots of suggestions, which we'll come back to in, in the Q&A. Absolutely. So maybe the first starting point is to look at exactly what a learning journey isn't. So traditional training. I can make this move on. Traditional training essentially is that one single workshop that could be a couple of hours or could be over two days where there's a heavy emphasis on knowledge transfer. It's very orchestrated around the content. It tends to have fixed learning objectives and often requires um, no pre-work or no post-work. Now, really good facilitators would include pre-work and would try and do elements afterwards as well. But essentially, it was like a one-off hit even to the point where someone might be in a room for two to three solid days, having theory and knowledge impounded into their brain, possibly lots of practice sessions, with the expectation they were going to be able to do something with that afterwards. Unfortunately, what tends to happen is people would enjoy those sessions because they'd be very interactive, very facilitative, lots of fun maybe. But when they left, a little bit like this image here, it kind of just comes to an abrupt ending and their learning journey is then allowed to be left simply to themselves and almost left to chance, if you like. Now, one-off hits of knowledge transfer are great if it's very, very simple, like maybe training someone on a new internal app. But if you're looking for significant behavior change, it's very, very unlikely to be successful. Where the learning journey differs, and there were some great, uh, great suggestions in the chat earlier, in my mind, the learning journey's focus is on the individual participant themselves and less so on the content of what it is you need to fill into your workshops. And so from that point, a little bit like this image of a winding road that heads off into the distance, in a way, a learning journey from the facilitator's point of view starts from the very, very first moment the participant is aware that they're going to be going through this learning to the point where they don't need to essentially practice anymore or to uh, consciously improve because they've mastered that particular area. When I say mastered, to enough to be able to deliver the level of performance that might be required. Now, because as facilitators and trainers and coaches, we are, in theory, experts in learning, I firmly believe we have a role throughout that journey and not simply just in the individual workshop, if you like. Now, this isn't necessarily relevant to all forms of learning. So like I said, that sim simple internal app that needs training might not need a full learning journey, but anything with behavioral change. So things like coaching, leadership, management training, sales training, service training, communication training, anything around behavioral and mindset change, essentially the participant will, if they're motivated, go through a learning journey and the facilitator can play a role in making that learning journey as rich and as successful as is possible. So in a moment, I'm going to go through some tips, so Jamie style, some tips and suggestions around how to build a learning journey. But what I'm also going to use is an actual program that uh, I delivered at the end of last year over a 12 week period, so three months, um, working with a group of managers on their coaching approach to their teams. And what we delivered over those 12 weeks, nine separate modules or sections, whatever we might like to call them. Each of those sections had a real blended mix of virtual workshops, uh, activities, single reflection, individual reflection, group reflection, coaching and practice. And essentially throughout the 12 weeks, they never had less than three or four nudges or interventions to be involved in every single week. 
Now, interestingly, with that same client, they had a proposal put in to work with that same group of managers on a two day workshop, packing everything into two solid days, run virtually as well. And we know that two solid days virtually isn't particularly appealing. Um, and essentially, these images show the difference. We were involved on their journey all the way through those 12 weeks. This one would have ended fairly, fairly quickly. And I'm going to share with you once I show you that program, uh, the outcomes that came out with that group of people in this quarter that they're working through right now. Now, before we get into it, what I probably should address is, is the idea of a learning journey is not some brand new concept. It's not the latest shiny toy. It's essentially been around for as long as learning has been around uh, and individuals would go through that journey. But what tended to happen was only the motivated learners would go through that journey. The ones that had a real personalized commitment to that learning would go through that journey and quite likely they would go through it on their own. And my perception of why that was is that traditional training for us as facilitators was a little bit of a comfort zone to us. We knew we were adding value when we were in the room with them because we were actively there, running our models, running our practice session, running the role plays, whatever we were doing. So we were adding value there. Because we weren't with the participants all the time, essentially we would step back and allow them to manage the rest of their learning journey. And for those that were less motivated, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Then, of course, two years ago, just over two years ago, we all got hit with this pandemic. And although it's affected just about every industry, the learning it essentially brought it to an end, didn't it? We couldn't run face-to-face -face sessions, certainly where we were hit with a lockdown straight away, all face-to-face -face learning ended. And until we realized that we could use technology, it wasn't gonna happen. We'd have to postpone the training. Then we recognized there was technology out there. We could run virtual sessions. Obviously, some of you fantastic facilitators might have been ahead of the curve and using technology. But for a lot of us, we had to start to learn this technology and realize how we could use it. But what happened, not only did we learn to use Zoom or Miro or Mule or Jamboard or all the apps and technology that is out there, we also realized that we had to deliver it differently that it couldn't be the same as face-to-face. -face. It couldn't be one big hit in two days. We had to spread it out. So the pandemic and technology pushed us, if you like, to deliver maybe some of the things we thought we were doing or, or wanted to do previously in terms of running blended learning journeys for our participants. A really good example of this is uh, one of our customers and clients actually, who work up in Scotland. Now, for anyone who might be aware of Scotland in the UK, might know that their biggest source of income is tourism. So all of the hotels, the golf courses, the campsites, it's very much a tourist destination. Uh, five years ago, they ran, uh, the government funded a leadership program for anybody who worked in the tourism sector. Uh, so a management and leadership program to attend. And they ran a two day workshop in one of the beautiful golfing hotels in Scotland. And after they'd put uh, 1500 people through this program, they decided not to run it again because the return on investment was perceived not to be uh, worthwhile. Um, the pandemic hit the tourism industry extremely hard, obviously up there. As they came out of their first lockdown, they decided to re, uh, bring this program back to life. And this time the company running it ran a 10 week learning journey with 10 separate virtual sessions, multiple activities in between sessions. They run 2000 people through this. So they were able to get everybody involved rather than shipping them all to one particular hotel. The impact since in the tourism industry in Scotland has been dramatic. With all um, staff surveys and business surveys, they're finding the staff retention and the performance and the engagement of employees is at record high levels. And one of the main uh, elements they're contributing that to is this particular program that has been run. And completely different to a two day workshop in a hotel. So let's just look at what goes into making a learning journey, and then I'll run you through a practical example that I've run. So the first thing for me, Jamie talked a lot about preparation for the virtual session. I think um, something that gets missed often with all of the training programs we might run is the individual focus with each individual participant in advance to make sure that they can actually get the most out of this program. And that isn't just a pre-course questionnaire. Sometimes we also lose sight of how easy we need to make it for people to be part of the learning and be involved in the learning and actually go through the whole journey. So we know learning itself needs to be uncomfortable. We need to make accessing it easy. There's a lot of work to do to make a group work well together. I often view a learning group as a high performing team. 
not just an icebreaker to get them talking to each other for two minutes. We also, for a learning journey as facilitators, we want to be a little bit like a barista that has multiple versions of coffee they can serve, not just our usual way of delivering it, just a single latte, which is almost like delivering a workshop and then delivering another workshop and then delivering another workshop. Let's really get a blended experience in there with lots of different variety. And we really need to individualize these. Often training workshops have fixed structures and content and learning objectives so everyone has to go through it in the same way. Even if it's the exact same performance outcomes we're looking for for a group of people, they will have an individual personal learning journey. So how do we do this? The first thing, and if I'm really honest, out of everything I might be talking about, in my mind, this is singularly the most important aspect here, is how we build that level of responsibility, commitment, if you like, their motivation in each participant to really lean into their learning. Learning isn't done to someone, they choose to do the learning. We can provide all of the infrastructure and scaffolding for it, but those individuals are the ones that will choose to learn. I would always have coaching sessions with individuals in advance of anything, even before I'd actually designed the whole program, to really understand what their why is. I'm sure all of us have been in this situation and all of us have either been the facilitator or the participant when we've been told to go on training. You're going on this training program, you need to go to that room or join that virtual session to go there. So often they have no real understanding of what benefit it's going to have for them, what it means in terms of their reality, how they're going to lean into it. So I would have that conversation with them and I wouldn't actually delegate that out to their line manager. As a facilitator, we're the ones that understand learning. So I'd have that individual, and it's a, a bit like a coaching conversation, if you like. What is their purpose? What difference is this going to make? What do they really need from this program? That's the first part of it. The second part of this, just as important, and I honestly, I know I used to miss this all the time with all of the workshops I used to deliver, is about learning is a real skill. It's actually learning really well requires you to be performing very, very well as learners. Do they know how they're going to practice? Have they thought about how they're going to practice? How are they going to get feedback from that practice? How do they reflect? Do they actually reflect? Where are they going to record that? How are they going to use that information? And also, how are they going to be a really useful um, cog in that group and contribute to the challenge and feedback and knowledge generation that's going to be required? I don't think that can be done in the first five minutes of your first workshop. That has to all be done in advance. And all of the information that comes out of those conversations feeds into the design of the program. Secondly, let's make this as easy as possible for them to participate and get the most out of everything that we might do in terms of the nudges and the activities and the virtual sessions that we run. Jamie's already covered some of this. Get them familiar with the tech before the live session starts. If you're going to use a Jamboard or a mural, get them using it in advance so they're familiar with it. If you're using Zoom or Teams, get them using that first off. Don't leave any of those gremlins or, or discomfort to get in the way of the actual live sessions. A lot of content can be created in a learning journey, and I don't mean the PowerPoint slides or the handouts that you create. I think the things that they generate, so the feedback from their practice sessions, the ideas that come up on the whiteboards or the flip charts, um, the reflective logs, have somewhere where they can easily curate and share that so that it's not lost on a random email. Encourage communication throughout the journey, not just whilst they're with you on a virtual session. Having a single communication space can really help this. Being away from social media can really help that as well. Accountability buddies and practice groups. Now, really integral parts of a learning journey. I remember running workshops where I would get to the end of the day and in the last two minutes when everyone's packing their bags up and, and leaving the room and mentally checked out, I'd be shouting out, don't forget to practice. Um, maybe you two get together and why don't you free form an accountability group? Far too late to have any impact. And surprise, surprise, when they rejoined me on workshop two, none of it had happened. Organize that stuff in advance. Individual and group learning logs. Reflection plays a powerful part in someone's learning journey. Make it easy for them to record their reflections. Have this all set up in advance. We often view reflection as an individual process. The group reflection is really, really powerful as well. On this coaching um, program that I ran recently, we used a simple Jamboard as a group learning log throughout the 12 weeks. We had a different page for each week and everyone stored their group reflections on there. One of the most powerful bits of content that was created entirely through the 12 weeks. 
this sense of high performing team is really, really integral to me. I'm sure we'll all recognize that people learn far more from each other than they will from us as a facilitator. And they're gonna be possibly working with each other throughout the learning journey. They need to have that connection in place, view them as a high performing team, get them being comfortable being uncomfortable with each other, get them used to uh, providing feedback with each other, get this all done in advance. I would run a live session with that group without even talking about the content to get them working together as a team long before we get into the module one of whatever that content might be. And then you can really tap into that power of them being that team of learners, as opposed to individuals with their cameras off, maybe not talking to each other. I talked about the baristas, um, mix up as much as you possibly can. I firmly believe, and this isn't about learning styles, this is about variety to prompt different kinds of learning all the way through the journey. Mix up the group sizes, the context, the mediums that you're using. If we're allowed to do in-person and virtual, have a mix of the two of them, mix the technology up. Bite size is much better than one big bucket of knowledge in one go. So spread out that journey, have lots and lots of nudges, rather than one big push over the precipice in one go. And keep this as individual as you possibly can. Build enough, one of my suggestions would be build enough into the learning journey that it's okay if some people choose slightly different paths at certain times. There'll be key elements that everyone gets involved in, but if someone chooses one activity isn't relevant for them, maybe that's not relevant to their particular needs and their particular path, and that's okay. So try and create as individualized journey as you can. Plan in as much coaching as possible. Get that individual being as responsible for their progress as rather than you being responsible for running a series of workshops. Now, I'm gonna quickly run you, we're gonna share these slides after, so I won't, won't go through every single element that we ran, but this case study that I'm gonna share with you is, uh, as, as I mentioned, running a coaching approach to um, managing teams. It was a global travel organization. There was 12 managers I was working with. They were spread across the UK, some were in the US, some home working, some office based. So there was no way we could get them together in one room anyway. Um, the business was rapidly scaling. They actually survived all of the lockdowns as a travel firm and currently are thriving, um, but they absolutely needed to scale quickly and they needed their teams to be high performing without that day-to-day -day reliance on their managers. Previously, their managers were quite traditional, did a lot of telling, instructing, answering questions, and they needed to shift that approach. So the program we put together had nine different sections, like I said. Each of these sections was not just a one-off workshop. There was multiple elements to each one. Okay, there was a combination of um, group virtual sessions. There was combination of individual coaching. There was combinations of individual reflections and group reflections. There was deliberate practice thrown in it all the way through. In fact, we started after the individual coaching session at the beginning. The first thing we asked them to do was practice before we'd even talked about what coaching was. Um, there was cohort activities. There was self-directed uh, research. And there was elements that they had to take responsibility for themselves and book onto. At the beginning, they were a little bit nervous about this, had not gone through something like this. By the time we got to the third or the fourth module, they were absolutely flying. They were producing videos of themselves with their reflective diaries each week. They were recording their walking practice coaching sessions and sharing that with each other uh, so that each, everyone could learn from each other's processes. By the end, I was giving them responsibility for running sessions on individual elements of coaching that they were thriving in. So we really handed over as we went through. Now, conscious of time, so I'm going to flick through these slides, but these will be available for you um, afterwards as we're going to share with them. And it just tracks through an example of how we built that program through with all of the different elements that uh, are relevant in a learning journey. So just to recap, individual coaching sessions at the beginning, work hard on their motivation to learn, their responsibility and their commitment. Now, Jamie made a point about kicking people off uh, a virtual session if they weren't um, committed, if you like. I'd like to almost go back a stage before and not get someone starting their learning journey until they are absolutely willing to take responsibility for it. We, it's not a passive process and we don't want passengers on that learning journey. Run a tech familiarization session. Jamie's covered that, get them familiar with it all. Run a practice session. There is nothing better for someone to get a sense of where they are at in their learning journey than a practice session at the beginning. Much more useful than simply completing a questionnaire, for example. 
run a team session to foster that community, to get them to know each other, to be comfortable being uncomfortable with each other before you get into your workshops and get them already taking responsibility for learning. I think there's a, such a, a good signal that someone is committed if they are doing all of the self-directed learning before they join you on the workshop. The people that turn up and say, I haven't done this, are already showing that they're not taking responsibility for it. Throughout the journey, try not to keep it a bland possession of the same type of intervention. I know I've run in the past um, programs over six months that basically were 10 workshops. Now, I tried to make the workshops interactive and engaging and brilliant, but it was still 10 workshops and nothing happened in between them. Mix it up, give them uh, use of technology, get them practicing, get them reflecting, get them running cohorts in between, accountability groups, lots of bite-sized nudges and interventions rather than one big hit. Far more effective at delivering change. As you're coming to the end of this journey, and now it's not the end of their journey, but the end of your interaction in them, it's a little bit like handing over the reins. Shift the emphasis to coaching, create optional elements in there, get them to widen out their practice so they're practicing in different scenarios and different ways without you being there. Uh, give them responsibility running those sessions and, and organizing sessions, if you like, so that they start to move away from needing your guiding hand as that facilitator. Now, just to put some tangible um, sort of results on this, that particular uh, company that I worked with the coaching approach have just run their single busiest ever quarter within the last few days of their single biggest ever quarter, their busiest quarter, they've got their highest revenue, their highest number of inquiries, their highest number of bookings, and they've actually currently got their highest level of client satisfaction. And those operational teams run by these managers are running about one person below their optimum amount. So they're understaffed slightly as well, and they've still managed to deliver these. And one of the reasons they're attributed to that is the style those managers have taken to managing the performance of their teams. And their ability to coach is blowing me out of the water um, as to how they've grown through those 12 weeks. I know completely differently had I run that very differently uh, with just a single hit of the workshops. So a little bit of a race through. Um, Jamie shared his contact details there. Um, these are my contact details. I'm more than happy to always have conversations and answer questions on learning journeys. Um, but we did want to allow a little bit of time near the end for a QA. and a uh, anything to do with Jamie's subjects on uh, virtual learning and mine around the learning journeys that you can build for your participants. Okay, great. Then many thanks for Jamie and Mark for your in in insight sharing. And uh, I think small moves can make real change. So um, concerning of timing. So shall we actually start with Douglas questions first? Um, is that okay? So I will just read that out. So Douglas asked, when you deliver virtual workshops, what would you say is a percentage split between deliver of content, instruction versus group activities and uh, interactions? Um, uh, do you want to go ahead for, first, Mark? And oh. Well, Jamie, I'm sure you'll have something to add here. I, my simple question to that is I would, because virtual sessions by nature are shorter, I would strip all of the content out that is you guiding and instructing to pre-work and use the virtual sessions all for interactive activities and exercises. And, and that might be an ideal scenario, but that would be my personal preference. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if you've made it a learning journey, uh, I completely agree with Mark. And my general principle is uh, less is more because people only learn when they're doing. Um, they're either they're doing something or they're reflecting. So the faster you can get them to doing or reflecting, the more effective their learning is going to be. Uh, I think the next question, uh, I think the next question is for Mark. Exactly. <laughs> <This is laughs> inertia um, and budgets, big, big challenge over here. Okay. <laughs> Budget session, I, I'd answer straight away, is um, build as much in of self-directed activity. So, for example, deliberate practice, reflection, uh, cohort activities, research, all the kind of things you can get them doing between your sessions shouldn't necessarily cost. You, you don't need to charge them for that, if you like, because that's elements that they're doing and they're taking control of. So I think there's a lot that you can build into a learning journey that you don't necessarily need to charge for or budget for. Um, inertia is a great one. Um, this is probably one of the reasons why um, 
I talk about these individual coaching sessions at the beginning. So much of training and learning is um, imposed upon people. Uh, and that's often where the inertia comes in. And so I would want to spend, so as, as an example, with that, that group of 12 managers I work with on the coaching program, uh, nine of them only had one coaching session at the beginning, were absolutely fired up and ready to go and committed. Three of them, more experienced managers, I have to say the more senior managers, were quite reluctant. It took three sessions with them before we got them to the point where they're willing to commit to it. Um, and I, I see that as almost the, um, the barrier to even running it is if like if we haven't got committed self-responsible learners there's almost no point running it would you agree with that jamie uh, yes <laughs> <laughs> kills a lot of training <laughs> um because a lot of training is like that um people forced into it yeah yeah any other questions and, and feel free to turn on videos or microphones uh, if you'd like to ask that way. Any other questions? I can see Derek's video. Well, I, I didn't want to dominate, but I'll, I'll add in. Um, my, my biggest issue with inertia actually comes from the HR. Uh, I've been trying to run these for 11 years now, and I've had a lot more success lately than in the past. Um, and the biggest, the biggest battle that I face is, is with HR and getting them. It, there's a tremendous amount of logistical hurdles that have to be overcome in order to, to do them. Uh, even be, before you get to the commitment from the the learners, it's getting over all those, you know, logistical hurdles. And that, and that I find is the, the biggest difficulty for me. And I think, I, I think that happens around the world in, in so many organizations. It, often training is seen as a sort of a tick box approach that let's just do some training and do it this way and deliver it. Um, and I, I have to be honest, and I know I was like this and a lot of um, internal L&D teams I come across are stuck in this almost this passive mode of, of having just to take instruction from the business as to what. And I really want to encourage everyone to push back. I often use the analogy of going to the marketing department and saying, we want you to produce this amazing new Netflix style advert that's gonna go out around the world and double our sales. And you've got 50p and a, and a mobile phone to record it with. They're gonna say no, and they're gonna push back. And they're gonna say, look, we're the marketing team, trust us on how you need to run this in some way, and this is a really easy answer for me because I don't have to do this on a day-to-day -day basis, but we have to, as, as L&D, we have to really push hard back and say, you know, the point of you having us here is we're the experts in learning. We can showcase to you how that's going to deliver rather than just send people on a, a holiday of a, a one-off workshop, which we know isn't going to happen. I mean, isn't, isn't going to deliver the results that we need. But I, I totally appreciate that's easier said than done at times. Actually, a, a question for me to, to Mark. Um, in, in my experience, I'm finding bigger companies tend to be more bureaucratic and there tends to be a lot more problems with L&D. And it's the, the medium-sized and smaller companies where there's a lot more flexibility. Do you find the same? Um, I do, probably because... If you, I mean, it depends what you mean by smaller companies, but I, I think of some of the clients I've worked with that are probably between 10 and 50 employees. Um, you're often dealing directly with the company owner or someone extremely uh, important in the growth of that business. With the bigger businesses, it's, it's obviously there's so many different layers that are in there. And I think the one thing that seems to be missing, I, I, rare, I can't even think of a single example in 20 years of being involved corporately in learning of a, an exec board that has a learning professional on that board. And so that's often the barrier. So the, the people that understand learning are not the ultimate decision makers and the size of the business, then it just, like you said, becomes a bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic mess. Interestingly, I don't know if this is only in the UK, but there's a, a sort of growing um, area of thought around the idea that what learning needs most in most big organizations is good marketing and being able to position learning in the right way so that people engage and understand um, what it can deliver for them and that learning itself doesn't market itself very well within big organizations. Now that's a very generic comment, but it probably sings very true of a lot of the clients and organizations I've worked with over the years. 
I, I think that also builds on something you shared earlier about how how some people actually don't know how to learn. They actually need help with how to learn. And I find a lot of people are like that. And uh, that uh, that combined with marketing for learning, I think a lot of people could benefit from learning how to learn better. I mean, let me give you a, a very tangible example of that. You know, how many times, for those of you that have run training programs, run workshops, run sessions with people, how many times when you got to workshop two, have you had to spend the first couple of hours recovering what you did in workshop one to remind people of what it was <laughs> because they haven't done anything between because they don't know how to apply stuff, how to reflect, how to practice. Um, yeah, it's a really good point. People don't necessarily know or, or aren't consciously aware of the way they best learn or the things they need to do to learn really well, which is why I would start any learning journey with that as the, the starting point almost. Yeah. Any any other questions or comments or thoughts from anyone? Feel free to share in the chat or voice out. So we have we do have time for one more question. So if not. Then I would like to, on behalf of the chamber, I'd like to thank Mark and Jamie again. And we were going to share the slides to the attendees and also the recording to everybody. So um, as usual, we would like uh, your feedback to our events. So tell us what do you think this type of event is uh, and what other topics we'd like to listen. And please feel free to scan a QR code or later I will send a follow-up email with the feedback link as well. So um, as you know, most of the activities we've moved either online or postponed to a later month. So there was one more webinar I would like to introduce to you guys is in the middle of April. We are going to have a SDG related um, webinar, which is um, on um, quality education. We have invited speakers from K-12, uh, K-12, uh, high edu higher education, vocational education sectors to share uh, uh, the insights of quality education and how it can be achieved through collective efforts. So if you are interested in that topic, please um, join us online again in April. And I uh, think that's all for today. So before we say goodbye to each other, we do hope you and your family like and your beloved ones all stay safe and healthy in this challenging situation in Shanghai. But everything should be good uh, like sooner. So thank you again and bye-bye uh, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks bye -bye. Jamie, thanks Mark. Thank Bye everyone, thanks Eric. Thank you. Thank you, bye. bye.